Hello everyone, I am Zainab Ahmed Saad of Memorial Institute of Ophthalmic Research. Our topic is how to approach a case of diplopia. We have to ask ourselves five questions. Is it monocular or binocular diplopia? Is it horizontal or vertical diplopia? In which direction of gaze does the diplopia worsen? Is it worsen for distance or is it worsen for near? Is it constant? or intermittent. Diplopia, by definition, is a simultaneous perception of two images to the same object, while definition of monocular diplopia is, it is the diplopia which remains when the sound eye is occluded. If you find a cause for monocular diplopia, then stop searching for other neuro neurological causes. Causes of monocular diplopia are refractive, irregular astigmatism, keratoconus, nebulous cornea, polyporia, iris atrophy, incipient catar, subluxated lens, decentered IOL, and retinal diseases that cause metamorphopsia or anisoconia or posterior staphyloma. Clinical assessment of monocular diplopia should have been whole as it overrides the irregular astigmatism and nebulous cornea. Also refraction and a thorough examination of anterior segment and fundus. Here is a photo of polyporia in iridocorneal endothelial syndrome of progressive iris atrophy. Also here is a photo shows ectopia lens which should have a clear lens bisecting the pupil. Also, here is a decentered IOL bisecting the pupil, and here is a central serous chorioretinopathy. The patient will complain from micropsia or metamorphopsia, which may lead to a difference, difference in, uh, in retinal image size magnification between both eyes with an isoconia and which may lead to failure of fusion detected as diplopia. Retinal correspondence. In the left photo here, it showed normal retinal correspondence. The fovea in the right eye and the fovea in the left eye projected to the same position in the space. Also here, the retinal area in the right eye, AR, and the retinal area in the left eye, AL, also projected to the same position in the space. So this is normal retinal correspondence. Normal retinal correspondence is retinal areas which is equidistant from the fovea. While in the left photo here, in the right photo here, it showed paralytic squint with the fovea in the left eye is matched with a non-correspondent retinal point in the right eye. So it will be perceived as two images uh, as a diplopia, as it is non-correspondent retinal point. Binocular diplopia can be detected as refractive causes uh, and decomitant causes. Although the usual case is always incompetent. Refractive causes as anisometropia corrected with glasses. Glasses which have a one diopteric power difference between both eyes, which will lead to magnification, retinal image size magnification by 4%. So if we have a four, uh, four diopteric power difference in both eyes, it will lead to retinal image size magnification by 16%. The brain will do fusion or will make fusion from 10 to 16% of retinal image size magnification. More than 16%, it will be unfusable and will be detected as the blue. Comitant causes, the most common cause of comitant causes is decompensated fovea. Also, there is virgin, virgins disorder 
convergence paralysis, convergence spasm, or divergence insufficiency. Also, skew deviation. Convergence disorders and skew deviation uh, is, um, is a supranuclear, yeah, causes of supranuclear lesions. Also, there is salamic isodeviation. Incomitant. Incomitant diplopia as any paralysis of any muscle should be classified into supranuclear causes, nuclear, nerve, and the muscle causes. Supranuclear or internuclear causes here as internuclear of salmoplegia, nuclear or infra infranuclear as three, four, six ocular ocular motor nerve palsy. Also, peripheral neuropathy, as Guillain Barry or Miller Fisher, and the neuromuscular junction, as Mycenae Graves or Botulism. Also, CCDD, which is congenital cranial disinnervation disorders. And uh, here are restrictive or mechanical causes, as Brown syndrome, fat adherence, and the muscle entrapment, as in blowout fracture, and thyroid ophthalmopathy. Also, inflammatory orbital diseases. Then the third question, is it constant or intermittent? You should know that by the history. If by history you know that uh, it is intermittent diplopia, then you should put in mind decompensated phoria, mycenae graves, thyroid eye disease, multiple scler sclerosis, convergence spasm, and divergence insufficiency. Clinical evaluation of binoc binocular diplopia, the most important uh, is to search for abnormal head posture. Also, orbital and delayed abnormalities, extraocular muscle movements, pupillary reactions, examination of cranial nerves, especially third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves. Abnormal head posture, persistent abnormal head posture denotes paralysis either in horizontal or oblique muscles. The right photo here shows a left face turn denotes horizontal recti paralysis and the left photo here show left head tilt denoting oblique muscle paralysis. Clinical evaluation of binocular diplopia can be classified into two sets of tests. Test 2 differentiate paretic from restrictive and test 2 confirm diplopia. Paretic versus restrictive could be differentiated by alternate prism cover test to detect eye deviation in primary position, duction versus version. version Saccadic velocity, force reduction test, differential IOB, and HES screen. And the test to confirm the diplopia as Maddox rod test, diplopia chart, Wars for dot test. Wars for dot test uh, here is a, a patient should wear red green goggle, always the red. On the right eye, RR, and the green on the left eye. The red filter here should filter out all the colors except red, will be perceived at, as two as two red circles. And the green goggle here should filter out all the colors and perceive only three green circles. The circle of fusion is the lower white circle here should be perceived as one. This is the circle of fusion. So the patient will normally perceive four circles if he has straight eyes. While if he has diplopia, he should see five circles. The last question here. Is it horizontal or vertical diplopia? We can know that by Maddox rod test. 
Maddox rod is a series of fused parallel cylinders which convert a white spot of light into a red streak. It's a simple test. We all have a Maddox rod in our clinic. Uh, if we are uh, evaluating a horizontal deviation, uh, then we should put the Maddox rod in the horizontal plane like that to have uh, a red vertical uh, line. Then here, uh, uh, isophoria is uncrossed diplopia, while here exophoria is a crossed diplopia. While if we are evaluating a, a hyper or hypo deviation, then we should put the Maddox rod vertically in order to have a horizontal red light. Then uh, this is a hypophoria and this is a hyperphoria. Maddox rod is simple, but it cannot differentiate between um, phoria or tropia. So we should combine subjective and ob objective method together. We should do alternate prism cover test first to know that it is a trobia, not phoria, and then do Maddox rod test after that to detect either it is a horizontal or vertical diploma. Then we can make at the other test is diplopia chart. Diplopia chart is to quantify the separation between two images in nine position of gaze using red green red green goggles. Also the red is on the right eye and the green is on the left eye. Then we should evaluate the primary position and the position with the maximum separation. As the position with the maximum separation is the position with uh, uh, the position of the affected muscle, the field of action of the affected muscle. So here, the position uh, of the maximum separation is in the right gaze. So this is either right lateral lateral rectus muscle bolsi or left medial rectus muscle bolsi. Then how to differentiate? Then we have to look at the farthest image, the image which is distant or peripheral. This image is the image of the deviated arm. Here the image which is so far away is the red one. So the basology in the right arm. So this is right lateral rectus muscle pulse. Also we have here uncrossed diplopia. Uncrossed diplopia will give, uh, will give isotropia, as in right lateral rectus muscle bones. Horizontal separation uncrossed, isodeviation crossed is exodeviation, while vertical separation uncrossed obliques, while crossed is rectal. Also here, we have to look in the diplopia chart as we have said, to the position of the maximum separation. Position of the ma with the maximum separation is in the right and down gaze or dextrude depression. Here, dextrude depression. All the elevation here is normal. So the problem in the, depress in the depressors of the eye. Either right inferior rectus muscle pulsing or left superior oblique policy. Then the other step is to uh, know whether uh, uh, is to know the farthest image away either is the right or the left. The farthest image away is the green one here. So it is left. Left superior oblique muscle policy. Then we have here two cases. Actually, the first one, uh, it's not easy, but I'd like to, to say it, um, to, hi to highlight it as it is life-saving. A 22 years old man presents to ICU with one day 
history of diplopia. Examination reveals limit limitation of abduction in right eye and the limitation of elevation in left eye. Pupil measures 7 mm in right eye and 8 mm in left eye with poor reaction to light and accommodation. Also, bilateral ptosis is present. So he has ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and the pupil affection. What you wouldn't do? Botulinum toxin, tinsulin test, lumbar puncture. Tinsulin, tinsulin test is of myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis cannot affect the pupil. It only affects skeletal muscle or striated muscle. So it cannot affect the pupil. So I would not do tinsulin test. So this is a case either botulism or gallium barre which will, uh, will uh, be discovered by lumbar puncture. So gallium barre and the botulism uh, is a life saving and emergency. So we have to know it. A case, uh, case two, a 72 years old woman experienced three 10 to 15 minutes episodes of diplopia in right eye over the past week. Her eye examination was normal. Recently, she had difficulty in chewing her food as her jaw becomes tired. Yeah, so she has a jaw claudication. What would be your next step? Jaw claudication, we all know uh, jaw claudication with a 72 years old, a very old age like that. It will be giant cell arthritis and we should do ESR. But I should stress here that in giant cell arthritis, it may not uh, be uh, the first complaint is transient visual loss, but uh, the, fir the first complaint may be transient diplopia, not transient visual loss. So we should put in our mind that when old age with transient episodes of diplopia, we should uh, exclude giant cell arthritis first. Thank you.